Uh, before I uh, start to talk to you, um, I, have you had a good time? Yeah. Good. Um, I think it's been great, and I do just want to uh, say thank you to a few people for the effort they've put in so we can have a good time today. I mean, not only uh, our speakers, who I think have each in their different way brought something important to us. Uh, I want to thank the home team here at uh, Stoke Gifford for not only making the building available, but having staff on hand to help with the AVA stuff and all that. We're very grateful to you. Particular thanks. I, um, I think nearly everybody, there can't be much going on at Hillside House today, I wouldn't have thought, because most of them have been here serving all of you. And uh, I'm so proud of our home team when they, they do that. You know, I, I have no anxieties uh, when I come uh, to something like, well, I do have anxieties, actually. I mean, my, my main preoccupation is, will the, will the speakers bring it? I think you probably agree that they have. Um, uh, but, I mean, in terms of just the way the thing works, I'm really grateful. I'm also grateful to Becky, um, the hostess with the mostest. <laughs> and um, it's, um, it's quite a thing to have the gift to kind of get up and, and keep people engaged, not least after a lunch like most of us pilfered off the tables there. And um, so I'm very grateful to, to all those people, and uh, I'm sure you join with me too in thanking them. So let's show our appreciation for all. <laughs> Um, what I want to do now is something that um, I'm not scheduled to do, to be honest with you, but I, as I've sat here today, uh, I have thought very carefully about how does this need to end. And I came to the conclusion that what I wanted to talk to you about is something that every soul in this place knows deep down inside. But that actually, in the kind of um, crucible of activity, of our busyness, of our belief that what we do is what makes the difference, I, I thought I would end by just reminding you of something. You know, you'd be glad you didn't pay for this, but um, <laughs> uh, I want to remind you that in the end, this is about our God working with people who are, certainly in my case, leading case, a wounded healer. I remember some years ago sitting with my spiritual director and we were having a general chat about wounded healers. So I was kind of hoping that the conversation was out there somewhere. And then he looked at me and he said, you know, the most dangerous kind of wounded healer is the one who doesn't know they're wounded. And looked at me and kept looking at me. And I said, is this something you know, you're trying to say to me? He said, no, you know, just go away and think about it and pray about it, you know, kind of non-directive uh, stuff. So what I want to talk to you about this afternoon is somebody, this may shock you, that one of the models that I have constantly gone back to in my own ministry, uh, 40 years on the coal face and too long in the coal manager's office is the person of Job. And I want to try and encourage you, not just those of you who are feeling a bit broken right now, but all of us, because in the end, what I truly believe is that what God's concern is to, f as leaders, whatever leadership role we take, is that what God's concerned about is to form our character more and more, that we might become more like Christ. And I realized years ago that one of the dangers of professional ministry, people like most of you and, and me, is that you can kind of easily believe that the gospel is really good for everybody in your congregation. And the danger of being a professional clergy person is you can start to forget actually 
this is as important for me as it is for everybody that I ever speak to. I, you know, I, I learned this in the most painful way. You have no idea. You have no idea how many times I have been broken to the point where I wanted to give up. When I was in Slough, I've never forgotten this. Uh, I started, the first day I turned up there in the city, you know, when you think the nosy Parkers would at least turn up to see what the new guy was like. I turned out there were four people there. Two old ladies and a young couple. Six months after my most riveting messages, we were down to three. <laughs> and one of them, bless her heart, was incontinent. It was difficult for her to sit still for long. And, and uh, you know, I'm like, where do I go with this? You know, my, my self-image is I'm going to be a successful minister. You know, the world's going to change because of what I do. And there's me and an old person and a really weird couple. <laughs> really weird. I had to learn in that moment and if you've not learned this, you know, I wouldn't want to force it upon you as a lesson. But I had to learn in that moment that I can't do this. I cannot do this. I know that the God of heaven and the earth and all that therein is has endowed me with some gifts and some abilities, but I cannot do this unless he is at work in me. I cannot do it. So that's what I, I want to talk to you about, and I want to just read to you some verses that are just so penetrating for me from uh, Job chapter 13. And you know the situation with Job. And Job was, uh, you know, you get this funny kind of prologue to the book where uh, God and the Satan are having this kind of dialogue about Job, and, and Satan's line is, yeah, this guy looks like he's righteous, but you know, put him under a bit of pressure, he'll crumble. And God says, no, you know what, I don't think, he, I mean, I'm paraphrasing, obviously. Uh, I don't think that uh, he will uh, um, crumble. So they set, they set this thing up where poor old Job uh, gets it, and it says that. Uh, just one th dreadful thing after another happened to Job. At Job. Satan's last word to God, uh, the Lord's last word to Satan is very well, then everything he has is in your hands, but on the man himself do not lay a finger. Well, it didn't quite happen, did it? But this is what happened to him. Uh, one day Job's sons and daughters were feasting and drinking. They discovered that uh, the oxen and the donkeys had all been uh, stolen by Sabaeans, whoever they are. While he was still speaking, another messenger showed up and said, the fire of God fell from the sky and burned up all your sheep, Job. And I'm the only one who's escaped to tell you. While he was still speaking, another messenger came and said, the Chaldeans formed three raiding parties and swept down on your camels and carried them off. They put the servants to the sword. I'm the only one who's escaped to tell you. I think Job was getting to the point where he's thinking, you know what, I wish one of these servants wouldn't escape. <laughs> you know, just keep quiet, there's too much to deal with. And, and then he discovers that the house in which his family were having a family celebration had collapsed, and they're all dead. And then chapter 2, is, uh, it says Job's second test. I'm not quite sure what it's talking about here, because his wife sounds quite challenging. <laughs> in there, you know, she tries to say to him, you know, you've got to give up with this God thing. It's not doing us and the family that much good thus far. <laughs> and, and so we come to um, chapter 13. And you know what's happening in it. There are these kind of dialogues that Job has with his so-called friends. People who are extremely well-meaning and trying their best to help him. But unfortunately, they ain't much help. And we've all got friends like that, right? And so in chapter 13, here's Job's, Job says this, so keep silent. Uh, this is chapter 13, verse 13. Keep silent and let me speak. Then let come to me what may. Why do I put myself in jeopardy and take my life in my hands? 
here's my key phrase. You know, this pierces me in the heart every time I read it. Though he slay me, yet will I hope in him. I will surely defend my ways to his face. Indeed, this will turn out for my deliverance, for no godless man would dare come before him. I can't imagine that there are many people on planet earth who could get to that low point in his life that Job had reached at that point. In the year 1898, Haydn completed his Missa Angustis. What it means in Latin, which most of you know, is it means mass for troubled times. Uh, Haydn, when he started to write the piece, was basically terrified because Napoleon had been sweeping across Europe. And Haydn was really worried because his native city of Vienna was deeply under threat. What he didn't know was, uh, Haydn this is, that at the same time, Napoleon was being engaged by Horatio Lord Nelson in what we now know uh, we call the Battle of the Nile. News didn't travel that fast in those days. But when Haydn wrote that piece, started to write it, he was terrified. And those of you who know that piece will know that the first uh, part of that mass, as most masses, began with, Lord, have mercy. A dramatic piece of music. You can feel the tension in the composer's heart as he wrote this piece. And subsequently, when he learned that Napoleon had, be, uh, had been beaten in the Battle of the Nile, uh, he, the whole mass became seen as something a bit different than it was originally intended. See, I think the first prayer of a godly human being in troubled times is, Lord, have mercy. I would even dare to suggest, I apologize if this is offensive, but if you have never prayed that prayer with anguish in your heart, then maybe you just need to kind of recalibrate your calling. What you are doing, my friends, at whatever level you're doing it in the church, I regard as the toughest job on planet Earth. Ah. Sounds a bit weird if a bishop says something like, I wouldn't want your job. Um, I've done it. In fact, the only qualification I have for doing what I do is I've done the job that many of you are doing. And I have been broken so many times, so many times have I felt like giving up. And along the way, you know, it's not that uh, people have done this on purpose, but at the time that I was thinking of giving up, I suddenly was presented with a set of circumstances that could have made that happen so easy. I was 43 years old. I was getting a little bored in the ministry that I was in. I mean, it's hard to believe that. And now I say it to you, but I know that I was. I know that, you know, the mid -mid midweek communion with the same old people saying the same old things was starting to wear me down. Just at that point, a friend of mine stepped off. He said, um, my company. I said, yeah. He said, I want to play a little more golf. He said, you wouldn't like to stop doing what you do and come and run my companies for me. I came within that far of saying yes to him. And then I went back to Job. Yea, though he slay me. As it says in the old version, yea, though he slay me, yet will I trust him. Listen, the great danger of what you do is you're going to get slain. I don't mean physically necessary. But you know what it's like. You know, well-meaning people, and some not so well-meaning, say some very harsh things to us. And our job is hard, and I don't know if it's harder than it ever was, but I just think there are things going on in our culture at the moment that make our job maybe even harder. 
and make our ability to misunderstand our calling harder. How easy in a world where there is a cult of celebrity to imagine that a call to ordination or a call to be a lay preacher is a call to be a celebrity, a rock star. How easy in our culture to become self-serving in a world of narcissism. I read recently A.A. A. Holsey, the emeritus a professor of sociology at the University of Oxford, said that it is a great fallacy to believe that individual freedom serves the cause of the common good. Too much uh, elevation of self is not good. And of course, this stuff feeds its way into our churches. And of course, what it means is that a lot of what we have to say feels extremely countercultural. In a culture of narcissism, how do you explain that Jesus said, if anyone wants to come after me, let them deny themselves, take up their cross, and follow me? It doesn't sound right to plain folks, does it? And yet the gospel, it's not about self-destruction, but it is about self-denial. I think our culture is entirely confused at the moment, and my own judgment is there's a kind of, uh, I don't know how to put this in plain language, but I think there's a sort of epistemological glitch. The way we do our thinking these days seems to me to be strange. You know, how often we present arguments as entirely binary, which means the space for nuanced argument is just not there. How much of what goes on in our universities and colleges starts from that deconstructionist uh, starting point? And then, of course, the linguistic changes, the excessiveness of the language. You can read that any and every day on social media. The anger and the hostility. It almost feels like to try and get heard, you've got to say something completely over the top and vaguely insane. I watched a um, TV program which one of my daughters suggested I watch. You can watch it, I think, at the moment if you want to. It's on iPlayer. Does, is that the right language? <laughs> and, and it was called From the Bronx to Bradford. And some of you would say, that's a pretty catastrophic fall, but um, uh, it's about a bunch of, uh, I think I only started with two of them, who were American Franciscan Roman Catholics who were called to restart a community that had long since kind of faded away next to a huge church called St. Francis in the middle of Bradford. They had a very simple life based on a very strong calling. Their calling could be put in a couple of phrases, daily prayer and serving the poor. Program chapters, their daily routine of you know, people who've really fallen on hard times knocking on the doors, some of them don't smell great, some of them are not well. So, you know, all the kinds of things that you know about happens when you start to deal uh, with the homeless. But I was struck when I saw that. You know, you could hardly say these people had a sophisticated strategy. I don't even know if they'd ever heard of an away day. But that was their calling, given to them by God. And because it was given to them by God, the impression you've got is that they're not going to let it go. Yea, though you slay me, yet will I trust thee. These people had no forward financial plan. Not that these things like strategies and planning and for, you know, financial uh, forecasting are wrong, but these people, in, heaven, in fact, they shamelessly begged these monks Two or three times, there's a guy on the end of the phone talking to somebody, you know, saying, we need milk. The next minute, the fridge is nearly overflowing with milk. 
And they beg so that they can put themselves in the place of the poor people whom they serve. They had a calling and they had a commitment. And I would say that they had a joy about them, though of course, like us, they had their disappointments. But they kept on going. And friends, one of the reasons why I have loved serving you, and one of the reasons why I love getting together with you is, that whatever your state is, and I, I can't pass a judgment on that, but like those monks, on the whole, you hang on in there. And on the whole, most of the time, you remain joyful. I have learned in my life that the times when God has really done something that has helped my character form more into the likeness of Christ have not been in the easy times. Not been when, you know, I was running a church and people were coming to Christ, not daily, but frequently. But I found that my character has been formed in those moments when I have had to be broken. I understand only too well what the writer of the epistle to the Hebrews wrote when he says that the Lord loves those whom he chastises. And friends, I say that because <laughs> I am a wretched sinner. I need to be chastised. I need to be chastised by the one who loves me more than I will ever understand. And it's been in those moments of brokenness, those moments when I felt trapped, those moments when I felt I don't know what else to do in this situation, when actually a rather basic idea has come back to me, and that is I could trust God and see what happens. And you might be sitting there thinking, well, now we know it's true. We do have an idiot as our bishop. But I hope I'm God's idiot. And I hope that I will trust him more and more until they carry me off this planet. It's funny. Everybody's saying to me, you know, come up to me saying, this will be the last time you do that. I've gone through my whole life believing anything I do could be for the last time. Because <laughs> I don't know when the Lord's going to call me home. So let me close with just three little words to you. Firstly, a, a special word for those of you who are feeling a bit broken. You don't have to come and tell me about it, or I mean, you can if you want, but look, I have found that the best thing to do is to hang on to Christ. And I've been tested in this. Some of you are being tested. Some of you have been tested in this. I cannot for the life of me ever forget that moment when I stood in the intensive care unit in the hospital in Oxford and looked at my sweet wife hanging on to life by a thread. I cannot think of a more penetrating and more breaking thought than looking at her and thinking to myself, this woman who I have loved and protected and tried to care for in an inept way for the last 35 years, and because I fell asleep at the wheel of the car, I've done this to you. But even in that dark time, there were some amazing moments. My third daughter, Alexa, who had been one of these who'd been through our church youth group, it was so easy where I was in parochial ministry. There were hundreds of kids. There. I mean, nearly everybody, kids peer group, uh, was a member of our church. So it had been easy. She goes away, goes to university, gives up the whole lot. I remember standing in 
uh, the sea talking to her in some small island off the coast of Greece. And I, you know, as you know, I can be a bit provocative, but I, I, I said to her, so if something happened to me or your mom, what would you do? This was ages before the accident. She said, uh, I'd want to come and see you. So I said, oh, yeah. She said, yeah. I said, that's nice. Anything else? She said, I don't know what you mean. So I said, well, is there anything else you'd like to do? I said, okay, Dad, I pray for you. You imagine how my heart skipped a beat when I walked into that intensive care unit one morning and my daughter was there pleading with God for a mother's life. So even in the darkness, there were chinks of light. And I made up my mind very early on, whatever happens to me in this life, I'm going to hang on. I'm not going to let go. And my goodness, there have been times in my life and there will be times in your life when you're hanging on by the skin of your fingernails. Secondly, pray on. Um, we've had a couple of reminders today about the importance of prayer. Got my, I was going to say, got my thong in my pocket. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yeah, you never see me on the beach, right? <laughs> that, okay, look, I've never bought one. I've never owned one. <laughs> I have never owned one. We focus a little bit around praying together. And of course, you know, it was interesting talking with Lee about prayer. I won't reveal to you the dark secrets of his prayer life, but um, we were both saying, actually, we, where we are is, it's a question of when are we not praying? It's more like a, a way of life, a way of looking uh, at life. And I find myself all the time trying to remind myself, you know, those Words of Jesus at the end of Matthew 28. You know, I'm with you always. There may be situations where I'm not terribly pleased to take God with me, but His desire is to be with me in any and every situation. And let me just say, you know, one of the things that I think we get very confused about in our teaching and in our churches, nowhere in the Bible does it say it'd be a great idea to have faith in faith. See, the problem with me is a bit like your problem. When I look at my own faith, you know, Jesus said, didn't he? You need faith the size of a mustard seed to go make cosmetic changes to the universe. It's called mountain moving, right? How big is a mustard seed? I'm not a gardener. Is it big? Do you need a forklift truck for it? You... No. It's tiny. And Jesus said, with faith that size... You can do great things. I guess that's just as well, isn't it, for many of us. But listen to me. You know, if we stop praying, amazingly stuff stops happening. And if you stop praying, I have two words of advice for you. Start praying. And the thirdly is, stay on. When I was a young fella, and uh, I, I mean, this is a shameful admission. Honestly, I never wanted to be ordained. I wish it wasn't my self-image. You know, I thought, yeah, I could live a normal life and, you know, have some fun. And, but m all my spiritual mentors in the early days of my, said to me, you've got to go and get your vocation tested. So we had this thing in our diocese called the Fellowship of Vocation. And man, it was so weird. A, it was all male. Right? B, it was some fairly strange all male people. <laughs> and I, I went there twice. And interestingly, I didn't plan it like this, but the guest speaker was the same speaker twice. And the first, it was, it was David Watson. Some of you remember him from uh, St. Michael the Belfry in York. And he preached a message first time up, and it had three points. This was to people thinking about ordained ministry. He said, status seekers keep out. Second point, status keepers seek out. Status seekers keep out. Third point, you've guessed, right? 
Second time I went, he came back. His point was, quitters keep out. Quitters keep out. And I remember he made this point. He told us that he had read through the history of revival. And he said the one thing that becomes blatantly clear when you read the history of revival is that when God did a major work on a human plane, the work very, very nearly came to a catastrophic end. And it was those who persisted through their potential failure who came out the other side and God did amazing things. I think one of the great mysteries of my life is why would God choose to work with a person like me? Why would he do that? I'm sure there are far more pious people. I'm sure there are people who, you know, love some of the paraphernalia of religion more than I will ever love it. And my only qualification, I think, is that I love God and I love His gospel. And I want to see as many people as possible while I'm on the planet know that gospel. Would be fair to say, wouldn't it, and a cursory look around the room would reinforce this, the raw material of the kingdom is never very promising. (laughs) It's about broken people, so often about people who've committed the most heinous sin. It's about people who get it wrong. You know, I'm, I'm really, you know, I see Peter, you know, in that moment when they're, they're about to arrest Jesus, and Peter c- picks up a, a blade and you know, cuts off the ear of the uh, soldier. You know, I could see me doing that a few years ago. Not, well, a long time ago, just to relieve you. <laughs> mm? Look, these are the people that God uses, and that's great. Because it's people like you and me. And, you know, I know that Nehemiah... Um, when he was, you know, uh, burdened by God and called by God to go and rebuild the wall around uh, Jerusalem. I know that he prayed, God grant us success. And, you know, the setup for that project was pretty tough, to be honest. And I don't want to talk about success. Not because I don't want it for you, But I really want to leave you with this message, very simple. Faithfulness is what will see you home. Faithfulness. Job had to learn something really difficult, and that is you've got to trust God even when every physical human circumstance will give you every reason not to do that. Now Job said, Yea, though thou slay me, yet will I trust thee. I can't say that I'm there yet. But I feel I'm in the company of people who with me are moving to that point. And I think it is that kind of faithfulness, that kind of abandonment to God, that kind of submission to what's going on around you, that's what will help us connect better. I don't think the world's interested in our easy, believest, lightweight, pathetic bits of testimony. I think the world wants to see a people who grapple face to face with the realities of life, which aren't always pleasant. People to quote the old song who get knocked down and get straight up again. I think that's what makes the gospel believable. And in this season of Easter, we thank God that we have something to preach because whatever the world threw at Jesus, He's alive. He's alive.
and he can make a difference to your life, even you professional clergy. And he can make a difference to the people you minister to. And I'm not going to be around much longer in this diocese to see it, but I know it will happen. Because I know you, and I'm grateful to know you. The Lord be with you.